Great job. Well, good morning. It is uh, great to be with you this morning, and welcome to the Ministry of the Word service at Believer's Chapel. Um, I know there are many still watching from home, but it is uh, wonderful to see faces in person, uh, even in this a little bit different way of getting together. We're still missing some of the fellowship that we typically have as we try to social distance. So if everyone would just continue to bear with us, but it is great to see you. And if you are at home watching, uh, we're glad that you've tuned in this morning. One of our memory verses this morning is from Isaiah, sorry, Jeremiah 15, verse 16. Your words were found and I ate them. And your words became for me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I have been called by your name, O Lord, God of hosts. Well, let's start our worship this morning with a hymn. Well, we want to thank you for registering to come this morning if you uh, did so, and that'll be the way we uh, continue to do it. Please do uh, make it a point to register. The nursery is back open. So please, uh, if you do plan on uh, bringing a young one, let Sarah Terrell know. And because we've reopened the nursery, we need help. So if you're able uh, to help in the nursery, please do so. Family camp reminder, it's coming up. Registration is open. Uh, It's on. We're going to get together at Pine Cove. It'll be great. Uh, Don't be afraid to come. Let's all show up. I know we're looking forward to being there. Uh, If you're following along, you get these bulletins emailed to you. You know we have a number of prayer requests uh, this morning, so uh, please take a look at those and be praying for those that have asked for prayer. I'm looking on my phone. I don't have a a printed bulletin. It's it's very difficult. Um, One of the things I was going to mention this morning, so some of the, you know, we're not having Sunday school, uh, but we are having some of the classes get together. So the Peculiar People class is meeting on Wednesday. So uh, if you're in that class, uh, please be joining in person here at the chapel or online. Uh, And this evening, we're going to have the men's book study at 5 p.m. And that will also be available in person or through a Zoom call. So you can reach out to Shane if you would like to attend tonight. And that concludes the announcements for this morning. Uh, Dan is taking uh, the day off. Jeff is here. So Excited to have Jeff give us the ministry of the word this morning. Jeff. Good morning. We are in 1 Samuel 3 today. I'll go ahead and read for us. See a water cup up here. I hope it hasn't been drank out of. 1 Samuel 3, this is the Lord calling Samuel, it's the word of God. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord before Eli, and word from the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were infrequent. It happened at that time as Eli was lying down in his place. Now his eyesight had begun to grow dim, and he could not see as well, and the lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. That the Lord called Samuel and he said, Here I am. Then he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he answered, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor had the word of the Lord yet been revealed to him. So the Lord called Samuel again for the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli discerned that the Lord was calling the boy. And Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Then the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. The Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. In that day I will carry out against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. 
For I have told him that I'm about to judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knew, because his sons brought a curse on themselves, and he did not rebuke them. Therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. So Samuel lay down until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord, but Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, here I am. He said, what is the word that he spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. May God do so to you. And more also, if you hide anything from me of all the words that he spoke to you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Thus Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and let none of his words fail. All Israel from Dan even to Beersheba knew that Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh because the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Thus, the word of Samuel came to all Israel. You'll note that last verse is actually chapter 4, verse 1. We can thank Stephen Langston for that from the 13th century. Uh, the word of God is inspired, but the chapters and verses and how are they divided up, in particular, that was done in the 13th century. So, he didn't get it all right. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we give you thanks for the day. Thank you for the Lord's day that we can come before you, and we know that you are God, and we know that you can accomplish everything, and you will accomplish everything according to your will. And certainly that would include the universe, and that would include us as well. Uh, for those that are in Christ, you uh, called us before the foundation of the world. You predestined us. The Son came and died for us, and now the Spirit resides in us. We have indeed the triunity of God working for our favor. And we bless your name for it. Uh, we lift up this day. We thank you for the body of Christ here at Believer's Chapel. Uh, we um, lift up those folks that have had um, impact and have been impacted by COVID-19, not only for the people that have lost some jobs, but people that, uh, that are underneath uh, the grip of this right now. I pray that you would just protect them, that you would help them to <clears throat> come back out of this your will would be done in their lives, and they would most of all have the peace of, of God that surpasses all comprehension, that they would cast their burdens upon you. Pray for the rest of us here today, and not only here, but also at homes that may be listening or, or watching. I pray that you would just uh, grant in us that which is pleasing to you. Your spirit would move in us, make us more like the sun. You would give me wisdom to make sure that I stay right on the text and most of all, that your, uh, your name would be glorified. In the name of your Son, we pray it. Amen. Well, let me give you some introduction <clears throat> regarding 1 Samuel 3. A couple of chapters for, uh, beforehand. Chapter 1, we've got a lady named Hannah who was uh, Samuel's mother. She's weeping. She's terribly mistreated by another woman named Peninnah who is the other wife of Elkanah. Peninnah has many kids. Hannah is childless. As Hannah weeps in the tabernacle, she prays in her heart to the Lord. If he will just give her a son, she will give him back to him. Eli the priest is watching, and he accuses her of drunkenness, which should reveal to you the time period in which they are living, which is the judges, as we'll, we'll talk in just a moment. Well, the Lord does grant her a son. She names him Samuel, which sounds like in the Hebrew, heard of God, because she has been heard by the Lord. Uh, once he is weaned, Hannah takes Samuel to the tabernacle, and Eli becomes Samuel's father figure from here on out. So when you see Eli and Samuel, you should remember that, especially in this text, as Samuel gets a hard vision from God as his first prophetic task. He's got to go in there and talk to his dad, that his dad's family is going to be destroyed. Um, because Eli has become a surrogate father, as we'll see. In chapter 2, we've got Eli's two wicked sons, Hophni and Phinehas. They steal sacrificial meat from the people. They commit immorality with the ladies who serve at the tabernacle. These two fellows are as crooked as a dog's hind leg. They are wicked, wicked men. 
But we'll see earlier in the chapter 2, if you bend your ear, you'll hear the song of Hannah in verses 6 and 7. As she praises the Lord for her son, then by the Spirit, she really gives the theme of the book of Samuel, First and Second Samuel. She says, The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and rich. He brings low and He exalts. And really, y'all, that's the theme that's going on here in the book of Samuel. We see the sovereignty of the Lord in the sort of reversal process He's doing throughout really both books. Um, earlier, Penina is the privileged mother. She has all the children. And yet we'll see the Lord will instead raise up Hannah, who's going to be uh, the mother of the, this prophet, great prophet in Israel. We see later on Saul, the tallest man in Israel, the man chosen by the people. And yet, just a few chapters, we see Saul's um, steel is nothing. And we, instead, we see David is going to, or rather, God's going to raise up David, a shepherd boy, while this man Saul is going down. And here in this chapter, we're going to see Eli, the priest and judge. And yet, God is going to raise up Samuel to really take his place. And not only as a judge, but also as a prophet. Pay attention to one other word as we cover this chapter this morning, and that's the word called. It's going to be used 11 times in verses 4 through 14. And as the Lord calls Samuel, I want you to pay also particular attention. The Lord is calling you today, if you have ears to hear. Not the same calling as Samuel. You're not going to be a prophet. But we'll talk a lot about what that means to be called in just a moment. So let's go ahead and dig into the text. Chapter 3, verse 1, it says, <clears throat> Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord before Eli, and word from the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were infrequent. Before I go any further, I should probably tell you, this chapter is chock full of spiritual lessons for us. Uh, I don't like it when people kind of grab these texts and make them force them to say something they don't. But chapter 3 has got so much here for us. So first off, we'll see this is a boy named Samuel. The Bible is very specific. In some of your translations, it's called a lad. Josephus, the historian of Israel, he wrote that he was probably 12 years of age. The reason why I mention this, I see some kids around here today. You know, kids tend to think, you know, one day, especially those raised in the church, you know, one day I, I hope to serve the Lord. One day I really want to impact. One day. And I have to tell you this. Do it now. Do it now. Second Chronicles is so clear. Verse 16, chapter 16, verse 9. It says, For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that He may strongly support those whose heart is completely His. So it's not, it's not too early. And Samuel, we're going to see that God is going to use him. And notice he's ministering to the Lord before Eli. So ultimately, he's ministering to the Lord. Uh, and my guess, it was probably some small details that he did. He's a 12-year-old. There's not a whole lot he can do as compared to others. But we have a guy named Oz Guinness, an English author who writes about this. He says, we are primarily called to, we are rather not primarily called to do something or go somewhere, we are called to someone. We are not called first to some special work of God. We are called to God. This is really right out of Romans 12, 1. I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Uh, you may have thought this before, too. I know I have. You want to do big things for God. Big things, right? I mean, not these smaller things that you think of, but when you read of church history, some of these great characters you think of, perhaps Hudson Taylor, Amy Carmichael, some of these people that had just tremendous impact, Charles Spurgeon. And yet, you need to remember this. What if God wants you to just reach your neighbor next door for Christ? Not just as if that's nothing. Who's to tell what that neighbor will do one day as a Christian? Or maybe your job is, is simply to take care of an ailing parent. And you go, man, I was always hoping to do big things. And I would tell you this, that just the very concept, the big things. What, is the, what does the Bible judge you for one day? What will you be judged for? 
Faithfulness, right? Faithfulness. That's what it comes down to. And that's why you have in Matthew 6, 33, seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. That's the idea, right? If the Lord wants to make it something big, quote unquote, in your eyes, okay. But I'm telling you what, the Lord is interested in your faithfulness, whatever that might be. As a matter of fact, a good idea is to put above your mirror just that one word, whatever. Whatever, Lord. You want me to do it? Whatever. Doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. And we see that from Samuel. He's just ministering to the Lord. And notice this word from the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were infrequent. This is the time period of the judges. Notice where everyone did what was right in his own eyes. It's a wicked, wicked time. And notice this. It says visions were infrequent. Yeah, the people were terrible. But uh, Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint. That happens to every society that casts off the word of God. Verse 2 through 5. It happened at that time as Eli was lying down in his place. Now his eyesight had begun to grow dim and he could not see well. And the lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. That the Lord called Samuel and he said... Here I am. Then he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. So right off the bat, we see Eli's eyesight. He couldn't see. He couldn't see well. The well is kind of an added to the Hebrew text. But I think that's probably correct because his eyes are growing terribly dim. And so it's interesting because if you know the Hebrew term for a prophet, At this point, when you read the text, you would smile and you go, ah, I see, he can't see. And you and I scratch our heads and go, what what do you mean? See, what does that have to do with it? Well, in Hebrew, the word would be, he was not just a, uh, Samuel was not just a prophet, he was a seer. The Lord is making him a prophet in this chapter. And a person that is a seer is a person that can see. He can see as prophets often could into the future as the Lord would allow that. Or also the Lord would actually let him be able to see the word of God as the Lord would give it to him and then he would give it to the people. So notice this. Samuel can see by God's grace alone. But Eli can no longer see. So the lamp of God had not yet gone out. And that is uh, because... The way it worked at nighttime in the sanctuary of the tabernacle, they would keep the lampstand lit throughout the night. That was according to Exodus 27. Do not let the light go out. And it really could be a picture of the Word of God, right? It's a lamp to our feet. It's a light to our path. And maybe perhaps the picture is the beginning of Samuel's ministry. The light of God had not yet gone out on the people. And God is going to bring in Samuel where the light would shine forth once again. And we have the Lord calling Samuel. Aren't you glad as a believer, the Lord is taking the initiative in Samuel's life and yours as well? Uh, We see in John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice. Why do you hear his voice? Because he's calling, right? He's always taking the initiative. You didn't somehow find the Lord. He wasn't lost. You were, right? Right? So here we have, he says, he calls him out, and how is uh, Samuel's response? Here I am. Whenever you see this in the Old Testament, uh, that is this picture of availability, you are ready to do the Lord's will and the Lord's word. You're ready to do it. We see this many times, and I'll list them out here. In Genesis 22, Abraham, here I am. And he tells him, take your son, your only son, the son whom you love, and go and sacrifice. Right? Genesis 46, 2. Jacob, Jacob, here I am. Go to Egypt. You're going to live with Joseph. I'm going to make you all a great nation down there. Exodus 3, 4. Moses, Moses, here I am. You're going to go talk to Pharaoh. Set my people free. Isaiah 6, 8. This is a little different because Isaiah overhears, by God's grace, the Lord talking. And he says, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then Isaiah shouts out, here I am, send me. 
Isaiah had no idea what the Lord was calling him to. The Lord was calling him to a judgment ministry where the people would not listen. And they would see but not perceive. They would hear but not understand. He, would, he was much like Jeremiah. There's going to be no converts here. But your job is to keep preaching. That's what you're called to. That's my word. That's my will. And then one more in the New Testament, Acts 9.10. Ananias, here I am, Lord. And he says, I'm, I want you to go visit Saul of Tarsus. And he's in Damascus. And Ananias, right off the bat, says, Ah, uh, I don't <laughs> I don't want to visit him. He puts people in prison, right? He arrests Christians. And God makes this very clear to him. No, go. I'm going to make him, a, he will be a tool, and I'm going to show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So this concept of here I am. As a believer, you should be familiar with those words. It means you're ready to do God's word. You're ready to do God's will. It's interesting, though, the way the Bible refers to two different, uh, two different ways, not two wills, but two different ways that the Bible describes God's will. The first is the preceptive will. I found this thing very helpful in my Christian life to, to really be able to see these in Scripture. First is the preceptive will, and that is the precepts of God, the words of God. Thou shalt, thou shalt not. That's what we're referring to, what is found in the Bible. Uh, that's his preceptive will. Give you a couple of examples. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. The Bible's very clear. Go make disciples of all nations. Amy Carmichael decided to, uh, by God's grace, to do that with, with the poor of India. And she saved many young girls from slavery and, uh, and led them to the Lord. For you, it might mean talking to your neighbor, talking to your coworkers about Christ. By the way, it's not optional. Right? This is a command. That's the preceptive will of God. Another one would be 1 Peter 3.15. Be prepared to make a defense for the hope that you have in you. So when you're at the water cooler and people start perhaps trashing the Bible because it disagrees with uh, the sin of uh, sodomy, uh, you, your job is to, with kindness and gentleness, say, here I am, Lord. I have to say something. I can't be quiet. I need to give a, a response. That's the preceptive will. There, how about the decretive will is the other way of looking at it. And you just look at the root word. It's the decreed will of God. His decreed will for your life. Uh, by the way, the term providence is really how God works out His decreed will for your life. Where do you see this in Scripture? Well, Deuteronomy 29, 29 is probably the best, uh, the most explicit the secret things belong to the Lord, Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever, that we may observe all the words of this law. So what did I do there? I gave you the decreed will, the secret things, the things you don't know that are in your future, the things that you can't tell, the things that are the decreed will of God for your life, for the world. But then the last part of that verse, but the things revealed, that means the preceptive will of God. Hey, I'm supposed to obey the word, the will of God. All right, so what would that be for your decreed will? Well, what if the Lord said, and he, we don't actually hear him saying this, but by looking at your life, what if the Lord were to say, I want you to be single? Do you say, here I am? Or what if he should say, I want you to be childless? What do you say? Here I am. Or if he were to say, I want you to be sick on the sickbed or with some sort of other issue, a relationship you can't fix. Here I am, Lord. Now, keep in mind, the Lord doesn't speak that way. The Lord speaks through his word. But the point of it is, is sometimes in his decrees, this is the way it comes down. How do you respond you see, the Bible is very clear on this. Psalm 115, verse 3, Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever He pleases. And Daniel 4, 35, He does according to His will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth. And no one can ward off His hand or say to Him, What have you done? See, the, the very futility of asking that in the midst of the decreed will of God. What have you done? And the Bible says, Don't. Don't do that. Don't go down that road. You see, the biggest reason why you shouldn't go down that road as a believer 
It's because everything that comes into your life is done out of God's love. He's doing it because He loves you. And you go, I don't, I don't like it. He's not asking. Right? Because He knows it's for your good. He's doing it because He loves you. So that's how Samuel responds. Here I am. And notice he runs to Eli. And he says, here I am for you called me. Eli says, I didn't call you. Go and lay, uh, lay down. It's interesting he, that he ran, right? My parents used to say to me, delayed obedience is really disobedience. Parents, you can use that. It's helpful because it's true. He runs. He's ready to do God's will. But he doesn't know it's God's will. He thinks it's Eli's. Verse 6 and 7, the Lord called yet again Samuel. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he answered, I did not call my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor had the word of the Lord yet been revealed to him. And we take that last phrase as to mean he hadn't begun his prophetic ministry yet. Right? We're going to see it. It's about to happen. So that's why he doesn't, when he hears a voice, he automatically thinks it's Eli's. And by the way, as a side note, perhaps Eli called Samuel a lot during the middle of the night. What we see in future chapters here is that he was very old. He was in his 90s. Uh, he was blind, practically, and he was uh, very much overweight. So those indicators would reveal that maybe he did call him in the middle of the night. He says, I did not call my son. Lie down again. And by the way, we're going to see in this chapter... It happens four times the Lord calls him. Four times. Aren't you glad of the Lord's long-suffering in calling you as well as a believer? That's the term we use, the theological term we call irresistible grace. We, come, we get this from John 6, 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. Whoever comes to me I'll never cast out. You see, the way it works is like this. You can resist God's grace to a point. Of course. You think of the time, how many times have you, uh, that you rejected the gospel before uh, the Lord drew you with cords of love and you came. Certainly there can be a bit of resisting, but the point of the matter is that God is going to overcome your resistance at the end of the day. Right? We see this in Acts 13, 48. As many as were appointed to eternal life believed. Listen to me. If you're appointed to eternal life, you'll believe may not happen in the times that, that uh, you figure, but this is God's will. So, verse 8 and 9. So the Lord called Samuel again for the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli discerned that the Lord was calling the boy. And Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. So Eli is discerning for the first time. <laughs> Seems a little slow on the take, but that the Lord is calling the boy. Now, this would be shocking if you're Eli. Why is it shocking? Well, you're the high priest. And not only that, the Bible is clear. You're the judge of Israel at the time. So what's really going on here? God is bypassing you and going straight to the boy. Straight to the boy. And it's interesting. In the text, it's clear. He's not going to just a man. He's going to a boy. Why is he, why, Eli's had to be thinking, why are you, why is God bypassing me? Well, let me ask you this. Can God set his child down to ride the pine and let another go onto the field of battle? Are there times, perhaps in the Christian life, where God could say, you need to, you need to sit down for a time? Right? Due to sin, ongoing sin, we don't lose our salvation. But is there a time that God can do this out of discipline because He loves us? Of course. 1 Corinthians 11 makes it clear that He can even take us home to heaven if we continue to rebel. So that's what's happened to Eli, as we'll see. It's interesting, Eli doesn't seem to begrudge God for, for this. Philippians 2.3, it says, regard one another as more important than yourself. But we're going to see as Eli is not seeking the Lord here. And he hasn't for some time, it seems. So he says, lie down. It shall be if he calls you that you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Your servant's listening. For us as believers, let's think about this. 
once again, God's preceptive will, his, the Word of God I'm looking at, His decretive will, what He has decreed for my life. When we come into contact with both of these, what should our response be? Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So when we come to the Word in the morning, in the evening, whenever, Revelation 3.22, it says, He has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Hear. Lord, speak to me, for your servant is listening. And really mean that. And beg the Lord, it says in, in Psalm 86, the Lord would open our eyes to the Word. He would unite us to Himself, that we would fear His name, that we would love the God, because this is where we get His wisdom. This is where we get our life. And not only that, should it come from the Word, but also in His decretive will, in the providence of how God works out His decree in our life. I like what Spurgeon says, Every time circumstances press in on you, say, speak, Lord, and make time to listen. And some of us in the midst of those circumstances, we need to pray, as it says in James, pray for wisdom and ask God that uh, that He would give us wisdom, but believe and not doubt in our hearts, right? So Samuel went and lay down in his place. He lay down in his place. Now, if I'm Samuel, I'm thinking, Oh no, God has been calling me. I'm such a knucklehead. I've gone into Eli's quarters three times. Is God going to call me again? What if he doesn't call me again? Have I missed, have I missed the boat? <sighs> right? But what does he do? He does exactly what Eli tells him to do. You go lay down. You stay put. Are there times that we need to do this as believers? Yeah, 1 Corinthians 7 is very clear on this as, He speaks to the Corinthians. Paul says by inspiration of the Spirit, verse 8 of chapter 7, I say to the unmarried and to widows that it is good for them if they remain, even as I. Um, He's referring to marriage. He's not condemning finding a spouse, but neither is he encouraging it at the time. He says it's it's good for them to remain as me, as as a single person. 1 Corinthians 7, 20 Regarding circumcision, he says each one is to remain with God in that condition in which he was called. Uh, If you're circumcised, don't seek uncircumcision. If you're uncircumcised, don't seek circumcision. Stay put. 1 Corinthians 7.24, brethren, each one is to remain with God in that condition in which he was called. He's referring at this point to those that are slaves. And he says, if you're able to become free, do so. But if not, that's okay. Because a slave is the Lord's freedman, and the freedman is the Lord's slave. Really, it's the Greek word minnow. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who remains or abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. I think the point we're getting at is this. The Lord, listen to me, is the captain of your ship, right? He moves you where he sees fit, and when he sees fit. As a believer, we need to lay down in our place. Trust him. Wait for him. I'm not calling for passivity here. I'm saying ultimately we need to wait for the Lord. And if the Lord has us in a place, we don't need to kick and scream. We need to stay put. I love what Dan has to say about this. Uh, he says, be where you're supposed to be doing what you're supposed to be doing. Be where you're supposed to be doing what you're supposed to be doing. And that's exactly what Samuel is going to do. He's not going to worry, did the Lord bypass me? Did I miss out on something? I'm going to stay put. Because the Lord's going to direct me where, and He's going to direct me when. My job is to wait. Verse 10 through 14. Then the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Verse 11, The Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I'm about to do a thing in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. In that day I will carry out against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I, will, I am about to judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knew because his sons brought a curse on themselves and he did not rebuke them. Therefore, I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. So we see in verse 10, uh, the Lord came and stood. 
Is this the pre-incarnate Christ? I think so. Uh, he, he, he's standing right here. Uh, Samuel is seeing something right here. And so it's interesting how Samuel responded. Did you see? Did you note? Some of you did. Did he respond exactly how Eli told him to? No, he didn't. Eli told him to say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Samuel just drops uh, this title for God. Why does he do that? Uh, Well, it could be because he just uh, forgot. He was nervous. Or maybe out of respect. I can't say, I can't use the name. I'll just say speak, right? We don't know. We'll ask Samuel one day. Behold, I'm about to do a thing in Israel, which both ears of everyone will hear it will tingle. The literally, it means to vibrate. In that day, I will carry out against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. Interestingly, the Lord in his incredible mercy, mercy here does not take Eli out in one day. But actually, the conclusion of the destruction of the house of Eli really doesn't happen for another 130 years where uh, Solomon will remove Abiathar. Abiathar is going to be the uh, priestly line of Eli, and they're going to remove that priestly line and hand off to another one of Aaron's uh, sons. Okay? So, um, but make no doubt about it. We're going to see, you could see this in chapter 4, the Lord quickly acts upon Eli's family. He says, for, and here's the reason why. For I told him that I'm about to judge his house forever. For I told him. That means in 1 Samuel 2, God has already sent somebody to Eli, a man of God. Eli knows this, and yet Eli is continuing in this action. What action is it? We'll see. Uh, for I've told him that I'm about to judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knew because his sons brought a curse on themselves and he did not rebuke them. By the way, that's better translated. He did not restrain them. He did not restrain them. So Eli did rebuke them in 1 Samuel 2 uh, because once again, his sons were stealing sacrificial meat. They were committing immorality with the women of the tabernacle. And they were wicked men. And they're continuing to serve as priests. So Eli rebuked them, but he didn't restrain them. And it's interesting, the cryptic phrase used in 1 Samuel 2, why he didn't restrain them. You know what it was? You honor your sons above me. You honor your sons above me. Spurgeon dealt with a guy who did this. Uh, his man came to Charles Spurgeon one day and said, I have never laid my hand upon my children. And Spurgeon answered, Then I think it is very likely that the Lord will lay His hand upon you. Oh, the man said, I have not even spoken sharply to them. Then Spurgeon replied, It is highly probable that God will speak very sharply to you, for it is not God's will that parents should leave their children unrestrained in their sin. Right? So if you have, uh, you're raising kids right now, you might go, I need to watch for that, right? Because ultimately, beware of falling into Eli's trap for honoring your own kids above the Lord. It's easily done. Uh, your kids may look like you. You, being like me, tend to be very selfish, and you, just, you want to just honor, perhaps, and, and go above board when you realize that what they're doing is clearly against the Lord. But I want you to note something else. I'll lay off on you young parents for a moment. Because Eli's sons are adults. They're not kids. They're adults. Okay? So, uh, what has Eli been doing? Well, he's rebuked them, but he hasn't restrained them. As high priest in the land, he could have removed them, or at least called for their removal. He doesn't do it. So, if you're older parents today, and your kids are older, and they're no longer kids, they're adults... I've heard this phrase so many times. Well, I've raised mine. If they're going to go down this road, they're going to go down this road. I mean, I I can't stop them. The Bible doesn't call you to stop them. The Bible calls you to try to restrain them. I hope you tell your kids that have stopped coming to church, hey, I love you. What are you doing? I'm concerned for you, right? I know ultimately, you know, there's no financial ties. You You can't force them. I'm not saying anything like that, but just... 
Much like Eli, be careful you're not actually honoring your sons over the Lord, your kids over the Lord, because you go, well, if I restrain them, it's going to hurt the relationship. Really? It certainly will. But don't you think it might actually hurt your relationship with the Lord worse? By not encouraging them? By not exhorting them in love? Eli doesn't do it. He honors his kids over God. Therefore, I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Now remember, he's already been told by a man of God in 1 Samuel 2. He rebuked his sons. He didn't restrain them. And notice, who does God send to now rebuke Eli? His own surrogate son. Verse 15 and 16. So Samuel lay down until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. But Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, here I am. Once again, here I am. So it says Samuel laid down until, mor- until morning. It doesn't say he slept. <laughs> it says he just laid down. Uh, and so he gets up and it says here, he opens the doors. And in some sense, there's a symbolism here. He opens the doors of the tabernacle. It is a new day in Israel. God has just uh, notified a young 12-year-old boy that you're going to be a prophet. And he's going to start prophesying here. And this is going to be his first task. His first task is to go and tell his father figure, the man who basically raised him in the tabernacle, God is destroying your line. And he's destroying your life. And he's scared. And you know what? We can relate to that, can we not? What does the Bible tell us to do? In Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, make disciples. Be witnesses. There's reasons why, as I've said before, there's reasons why they don't put you underwater at the baptism and leave you there. you got work to do. Right, And um, what happens? We get scared. We get fearful. And part of it is because we don't want to be rejected. Because we have to talk to people and we have to say, your, your line is destroyed. Your life is destroyed. You have no hope without Christ. And we have to tell them, the Bible is very clear. The wages of sin is death. One day you're going to die for your sins for eternity. And there's no hope for you. But the Bible's very clear, Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. Three days later, he rose from the dead. And we can tell them he's coming back. He's going to judge the world. He's going to make all things new. And your job is to simply come to him with your sin in hand and realize that you, you're never going to be righteous enough. Only Christ will get you there. Only Christ. And it's the great exchange You give him your sin, he gives you his righteousness. No, of course, we're not talking legalism. You never come to the place that you you, uh, never sin anymore. You're always a sinner. But at this point, at the point of coming to Christ, you're now a saint. You're righteous in God's sight because of the blood of Christ. We have to tell people that. That's That's our job, right? Well, we can relate to Samuel. We don't want to talk. He don't want to talk, but we're called to talk. So verse 17, uh, what is the word that he spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. May God do so to you, and more also, if you hide anything from me of all the words that he spoke to you. You know what's interesting? Eli, who loves this boy, he pronounces a curse upon him. Did you catch it? And now you're looking at verse 17, and you go, I, I don't see a curse there. No, there's a curse there. It's implied. And this is what they would do in the, uh, among Hebrews. They would say, may God do so to you and more also. And you're like, well, where's the curse? It was there. You didn't catch it. It's implied. And the idea is do so to you. You wouldn't say it out loud, but you knew. And what really was that? Well, it's, it's probably the idea of anathema. May God eternally condemn you. Right? And more also, (laughs) if you don't tell me everything. So verse 18, 
So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Samuel, way to go. By God's grace, way to go. He told him everything. As believers, our job is to be faithful to the Word of God. Is to, is to not waffle. Right? How many times, believers, do we do this? That we'll kind of hedge our conversations, we'll be kind the way we speak about things, and we certainly should be kind and gentle and winsome. But at the same time, we've got hard news. Right? And what Paul can say is true for, of us in Acts 20, 27. I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. I may have been scared, but I didn't shrink from it. I continued to be faithful to what God told me. So what is Eli's response? Eli's response, y'all listen, is very cryptic. It's interesting. I honestly don't know. I'm telling you. I don't know if what he does is a bad response or a good response. Let me tell you why. First off, if it is a bad response, what I mean by that is where's Eli's repentance? A man of God has been sent to him in 1 Samuel 2. A boy named Samuel, his son, in essence, has been sent to him in 1 Samuel 3. Where's his repentance? Where's his confession going, I'm in sackcloth and ashes? What am I thinking? What was I doing? What have I been doing in my life? He doesn't do that. There's no repentance, at least we can read here. Bob Deffenbaugh puts it like this. He's, a, he's pastoring at a Community Bible Church. He says, uh, Community Bible Chapel. He says, God's judgment cannot be avoided, but Eli can at least repent of his own sins of neglect. Instead, Eli speaks words which have a religious ring and appear to be an evidence of his submission to the sovereign will of God, but which are really an expression of Eli's willingness to continue on in his sin. What we read is not an expression of faith in God's sovereignty, but an expression of fatalism couched in religious terms. So, is that what he's saying? Or is it actually a good response? The good response, what I mean by that, is that he didn't complain to God's judgment as Cain did. He actually seems to submit to God's will. There is an issue of submission, submission to God's will. You've heard of the phrase, spare the rod, spoil the child. The Puritans would say, kiss the rod, in the sense that when the Lord disciplines you, that He disciplines you in love as a dad. You're His son. Psalm 145, verse 17, to believers, it says, The Lord is righteous in all His ways and kind in all His deeds. He's kind. Psalm 23, 6, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Now, you may not like the Lord's discipline, and I don't particularly enjoy it either when it comes my way, but... Just because I don't like the wrapping paper doesn't mean it's not for my good. A guy named Richard Cameron in the 1600s, he was a uh, Scottish Presbyterian. He resisted the king who tried to control the church, uh, the church authorities. Uh, but the sheriff and the men, they captured and they killed him. They cut off his head and hands and they brought his head and hands to Edinburgh where they brought it to his father, Alan, who was imprisoned. The guards callously showed the old man his son's head and hands and asked him, Do you know them? The old man knelt down and kissed his son's head and said, I know them. I know them. They are my sons, my own dear sons. It is the Lord. Good is the will of the Lord who cannot wrong me or mine, but has made goodness and mercy to follow us all our days. That's a man that understood the Lord's kindness and the Lord's will. So which one is right? Eli, was it a bad response? Was it a good response? I guess I would say this, is that, hey, as the Lord convicts you of sin, repent. Confess that. And then as the Lord disciplines you for a particular sin, in particular, submit without complaint. It finishes up. Verse 19 through Chapter 4, verse 1. Then uh, thus he, uh, Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fail. And all Israel from Dan, even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh, because the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Thus the word of, the, of Samuel came to all Israel. So when it says he let none of his words fail, uh, 
that's not the best way to put it. I really wish they had just stuck with the Hebrew text. It says, he let none of his words fall to the ground. Because that phrase is an archery term. It's an archery metaphor. And the idea is Samuel's words hit the mark. Why? Because they were the words of God. They didn't fall. All Israel from Dan even to Beersheba. That can, that's the whole country, north to south. And they knew that Samuel was a prophet. He was a spokesman for God. It's sad. The Lord is doing yet another reversal here. Eli is benched. And Samuel is taking his place, not only as judge, but prophet. In conclusion, I think we can learn a couple of things from these men. Eli, if you're a believer, are you mortifying the sin in your life? Are you mortifying it? I'm not discounting the grace of God as He does it through you, but are you doing it with Him? Romans 8.13, it says, If you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you're putting to death, i.e. mortifying, the deeds of the body, you will live. Or the way John Owen puts it, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. Are you learning from Eli today? The Bible is very clear. Romans 15.4, everything was written in the past was written for our benefit, for our edification. How about Samuel? Like Samuel, I think it's important to note you've been called. You've been called in at least three ways, and we could list more. But number one, most importantly, you've been called to salvation as a believer before time even began. Revelation 13.8, it says our names have been written in the book of life before the world was created. God loves you. He knows you by name. Isaiah 43.1, it says I have called you by name and you are mine. Isn't that awesome? He knows your name. He knew it before eternity. Even with a strange name like mine, Geoffrey. So I get called. I'm thinking the angels have got this right as they read it off. But my name's written. It's been written since the beginning of time. How about called to ministry? That's another way we've been called. Ephesians 2.10, we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Um, when it comes to ministry, let me tell you, my wife and I went to Hawaii back in January. We saw these beautiful pictures, or I saw these beautiful pictures of fish, but you don't see them when you're standing on the shore. Why not? Because you've got to get in the water. And there they are. And there you experience it. And so as a believer, my encouragement is get in the water. You've not been called to great works. You've been called to a great God. And as you are called to that great God and you're called to His church, the Lord raises ministry up. Your job is just be ready. And thirdly, you've been called to obey and submit to God's Word and God's providence. And are you doing it? Are you doing it today? Are you struggling? I can relate. You see, the way we know God's will is God's Word. How can you hear the Lord today if you're not in His Word? The Lord directs your steps, and He does it through prayer and the Word, and He will do it. That's the sweet thing about it, y'all. He will direct your steps. He will do it. So, when it comes to the preceptive will of God, His Word, what's your answer when He calls? And He calls every day in His Word. You say, here I am. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And when it comes to His decretive will and how He works that out in His providence, Whatever happens, when he calls, you say, here I am. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. If you've not yet heard the voice of the Lord, maybe you're hearing it today. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 and 29, Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble at heart and you will find rest for your souls. The only thing you bring today is your sin. I'm going to close us in prayer, and then we'll join together in a, uh, listening to a hymn and taking the Lord's Supper. Please join me in prayer. Father, we give you thanks for the lessons of this chapter. Thank you for your grace, your kindness, Lord. Even the times that we get off track, and we do it every day, your grace is new every morning. 
Your faithfulness reaches to the skies. Our job is simply to just walk with you. And as we wander, Lord, we pray that you would help us to come right back because you will never let us go. You can't. You do not lie. You love us so much. We thank you for it. In your son's name we pray, amen. Thank you again, ladies. It's hard not to sing, isn't it? You did well uh, today. Soon, I hope, we'll be back to that. Who knows? Uh, changes from week to week, doesn't it? Well, for many, many years here at Believer's Chapel, uh, one of our uh, beloved uh, founding elders, Howard Pryor, uh, presided at our observances of the Lord's Supper. And one of the things he habitually would remind us of is that the Lord's Supper is for the Lord's people. His intent was to advise us that though it's possible for an unbeliever uh, to physically partake of the supper, the Lord's intent in providing the ordinance was for the members of his body to join together in observing it as an act of remembrance of his sacrifice on the cross, which brought them forgiveness, uh, adoption into God's family, uh, the promise of eternal life, uh, the saving relationship he provided for those who believe in him is a, a treasure. Uh, but not all people have received that treasure. It was never intended to be for everybody, though we might wish uh, that could be true. Instead, it is for those who have been illuminated by the Spirit of God and received the gift of faith. Uh, others, the scriptures teach, have been blinded from seeing the truth of the gospel. That's made clear in several places in God's word, uh, but in none perhaps more than in Paul's second epistle to the Corinthians in chapter 4 where the apostle explains, beginning in verse 3, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the eyes of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And Paul goes on to say, we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus is Lord and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not of ourselves. Well, that's a profound uh, passage, uh, one uh, certainly worthy of our consideration, but now is not the time uh, for that. But what it teaches, as does the whole Bible, is that salvation is a gift. It is not, as Paul says, of ourselves. And as he wrote elsewhere, it is by grace we have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And so therefore we approach the Lord's table with humility and with gratitude, uh, recognizing the free gift that is ours and is the invitation to come and eat, to come and to drink. That is the worthy way of observing the Lord's Supper. It is because God is the one who has shown in our hearts to enlighten us and to give us this common faith that is ours. There is nothing in us that would commend us to God. Like Samuel, uh, the Lord has pursued us and called us and placed us in the favorable position in which we find ourselves. God's power is perfected in our weakness. And the result is that our salvation is not secured by any inherent worthiness. We're earthen vessels uh, but by the greatness of the power of God made manifest against all the world's pretensions in the foolishness of the cross. To the world, folly 
as Paul said in yet another place, but to those who are the called, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. And so we come now in obedience to the Lord's command to observe his Lord's Supper in remembrance of him, uh, taking now the bread as he took it and remembering that he said, this is my body given for you. He offered his life as an atoning sacrifice for our sins so that we might have life in him. Uh, Let me now give thanks for the bread. Father, we thank you uh, for this bread, which is, uh, as you said, uh, when you offered it to us, it is a reminder that you offered your life in the place of ours, that it was our lives that were due to your judgment, uh, our sins that needed to be atoned for, and yet uh, you took upon us our sins, and you bore the penalty for them. And we say, we praise you, O Lord. We thank you. We love you, uh, dear Lord Jesus, for doing that for us. And we lift up our hearts now in remembrance. In his... John chapter 6, verse 53 through 56. Jesus has large crowds. And then he loses them. He didn't lose anything. But ultimately, many walk away because it was hard language. Verses 53 through 56. Jesus said to the crowds, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Just a couple of comments. Um, As we gather today with the Lord's Supper, it applies here. Uh, If you are without Christ, I'm looking at dead people. Verse 53 He doesn't eat of the flesh, drinks the blood. He has no life. I'm talking to dead people. But the Bible is also equally clear in verse 54. Whoever feeds on my flesh, drinks my blood, has eternal life. Present tense. John 6 speaks of the same thing. If you're a believer today, you have eternal life. It doesn't feel like eternal life, but you have it. It's it's obtained by Christ on the cross, he said, to tell us, die, it is finished. It's paid. Your debt is paid. You've got nothing to pay. That's what grace is. It's getting what you don't deserve. And ultimately, that's what we have here. Is if you're in Christ today, you can join us in the Lord's Supper. And no, we don't, uh, we don't physically eat of his flesh and drink of his blood, but certainly we, we do symbolically in remembrance of him. It's a constant reminder of what a great sinner I am. But it can't stop there. It's even a bigger reminder of what a great Savior I have. I am righteous because of Christ. Last thing, verse 56. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me. There's our word again. Remains. Remains. Your job as a believer, remain. Abide in Him. See, He abides in you because without Him, you could do nothing. Are you abiding in Him today? Are you remaining in Him? If you are in Christ, you are abiding in Him. You are remaining in Him. Let's give thanks for the cup. Father, we give you thanks for the cup. Thank you, Lord, for these timely uh, remembrances of the Word and the cup that we could remember what Christ did for us And Lord, we look forward to the day that we don't take the Lord's Supper because we're enjoying the wedding supper of the Lamb. And we will enjoy it one day in eternity, and we look forward to that. And we uh, ask as the Apostle John says, come soon, Lord Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Well, this concludes our service today. Dan will be back next Sunday. 
I don't know where he is today. A slacker. I'm going to have to give him a hard time. Let's pray. Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. You're dismissed.